Please be seated. Welcome to Christ the Cornerstone, the city center church of Milton Kings. In 1992, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II opened and dedicated this place of worship. And 30 years later, we meet on this day in this same place, people from all corners of the earth, from all paths of life, of all abilities, young and old, people of many faiths and none, to bid farewell to our late monarch, whose life of service to the nation and the world we remember and pay tribute today. Welcome to the Church of Christ, the Cornerstone.
you can shed tears that she is gone. You can shed tears that she is gone, or you can smile because she has lived. You can close your eyes and pray that she'll come back, or you can open your eyes and see all she's left. Your heart can be empty because you can't see her, or you can be full of the love you shared. You can turn your back on tomorrow and live yesterday. Or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember her and only that she's gone. Or you can cherish her memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind, be empty and turn your back. Or you can do what she'd want. Smile, open your eyes, love, and go on. Thank you. In gratitude, we bid farewell to our greatly loved Queen for her grace, humanity, and sympathy, for her courage in adversity, for the happiness she brought to so many, for her steadfast pilgrimage of faith for her example of service and for the duty which she rendered unflinchingly to her country 
we thank and praise Almighty God. As we commend Elizabeth, his servant, to God's mercy, let us especially pray for her family in the loss. We are all visitors to this time, this place. We are just passing through. Our purpose here is to observe, to learn, to grow, to love. And then we return home. It is with untold sadness that I make this address. In these past days, we have witnessed outpourings of grief and gratitude from around the world for the life of Her Late Majesty the Queen. It was one particular world leader who summarised her impact so succinctly in these words. In a changing and churning world, you became an anchor for our age. You became a living symbol of grace, constancy, and dignity. Those were the words of Ban Ki-moon, then Secretary General of the United Nations, when the Queen visited the General Assembly in New York on the 6th of July, 2010. Those three qualities, grace, constancy and dignity are what most signally reflect the character of the Queen's reign. The grace with which she conducted herself as monarch, 
the constancy she showed through difficult times, and the dignity that she maintained as an individual. The constitutional monarchy in our country has a rhythm and a pattern that runs in the background of our lives, but is at the heart of our nation. It is a role that demands of the sovereign something that can be characterized in a single word, duty. The unwavering dedication and sense of duty exhibited by Her Majesty over the length of her reign have been like no other before her. Every year she opened Parliament. Every day she dealt with government papers in the never-ending stream of red boxes which pursued her wherever she was. Every week the Queen had an audience with the Prime Minister. As a new monarch with an ageing Winston Churchill and then as a wise and experienced confidant of the 14 men and women who were to follow. When it comes to the nation's governance, the role of constitutional monarch is not one in which a sovereign is able to exercise a great deal of personal choice. When Pietro Anigoni was painting his beautiful portrait of the Queen in the robes of the Order of the Garter, she is reported to have told him, this morning at the opening of Parliament, I have made one of the dullest, most boring speeches of my life. It dealt with such dry material. One tries at least to put a little expression into one's voice, but it is not humanly possible to produce anything remotely lively. Yet outside the confines of her constitutional functions, the Queen's warm and engaging personality, lit with her keen sense of humour, has been the constant hallmark of her reign. As head of state, she has travelled the world, acting as an exemplary ambassador, using the royal yacht as the base for many state occasions and offering personal attention and understanding to all those whom she met. At home, she continued this role, receiving presidents, kings and queens on state visits. Her attention to detail was legendary. She would check every banqueting table, bedroom and reception before guests arrived and frequently unearthed objects of common interest and shared history from the royal collections and archives. And her role as head of state has been pivotal in our armed services. Every commissioned officer swears allegiance to the crown. She was toasted at every mess and wardroom dinner. She was the focus of birthday parades, salutes at horse guards and fly pasts over the Buckingham Palace balcony. She was also the individual who, year in, year out, led the nation in remembrance at the Cenotaph, uttering the words for her that were heartfelt, we will remember them. That ceremony, if no other, reminded us that the dignity with which Her Majesty bore herself also carried with it great humility, a quality she frequently revealed when engaging with those she met. At medal ceremonies and investitures, she would find just the right words to say to each recipient. On one occasion, when presenting a medal to a soldier for gallantry, he remarked, it was just the training, ma'am, to which she replied, probably training is the answer to many things. But there is a particular quality for which the Queen herself should be recognized, her steadfast faith. As head of the Church of England, she has demonstrated her total commitment to upholding the tenets of the Christian faith and supporting a succession of church leaders. 
There have been seven Archbishops of Canterbury during her reign, broadly one for each decade. They too all swore an oath of allegiance to the monarch as defender of the faith. Whilst the Church has experienced profound change during the course of Her Late Majesty's reign, the makeup of our country, alongside that, has become increasingly multi-faith and multicultural. The Queen first visited a mosque during her Golden Jubilee tour of 2002 at the Islamic Community Centre in Scunthorpe. With the Duke of Edinburgh, she visited the Highgate Hill Murugan Hindu Temple in North London in the same year. The Queen's Christmas message regularly reflected her deep respect for faiths and denominations other than her own. In 2004, she remarked, everyone is our neighbor, no matter what race, creed, or color. And leaders of different denominations and faiths have been routinely represented at major ceremonial occasions with a religious dimension. In the past days, we have heard from religious and political leaders around the world, all of whom express their shock and sorrow at the passing of a very great monarch. Not the least of these tributes have come from leaders of the Commonwealth, an affiliation of nations to which Her Majesty was passionately committed. Today's Commonwealth of Nations is a far cry from its early small beginnings at the start of her reign. But it has been the Queen's unswerving commitment as its head and as a non-political presence that has served to encourage the growth of the organization and to bind it together. Her Majesty spoke movingly when she said, if we all go together with an unwavering faith, a high courage and a quiet heart, we shall be able to make this ancient commonwealth, which we love so dearly, an even grander thing, more free, more prosperous, more happy, and a more powerful influence for good in the world. And it is surely that one of the Queen's most notable gifts was her ability to bring people together in a spirit of genuine harmony. In 2012, it was an encounter close to home that perhaps most tellingly symbolized a sense of progress and re reconciliation. At a charity event in Belfast, a private handshake. Then a later public handshake with Martin McGuinness marked a moment of closure to a conflict that had personally affected her family as well as much of her reign. McGuinness told the Queen that their meeting was a powerful symbol that peace building requires leadership. Leadership. It was a theme that the Queen herself chose for her Golden Jubilee speech to the United Nations in 2002. Her words on that occasion are ones that leaders in all walks of life might usefully reflect upon. She said, I know of no single formula for success, but over the years I have observed that some attributes of leadership are universal and are about ways of encouraging people to combine their efforts, their talents, their insights, their enthusiasm, and their inspiration to work together. It has been said often that the Queen has been a symbol of constancy in an era of rapid change, but it is equally true that change is something she herself embraced. During her long reign, Her Majesty has witnessed and championed a vast array of technological developments. Ever since, 
her first live Christmas broadcast on television in 1957. In 1976, she was the first monarch to send an email during a visit to the Royal Signals and Radar Establishment. And in October 2014, she opened the Information Gallery at the Science Museum by removing a glove and sending her first tweet to the world, no less than 76 years after her first visit to that museum. And surely, we see the Queen in that broad light, someone who was always with us, who understood us and was there for us. Her encouraging voice was heard on her myriad visits to hospitals, schools, businesses, charities, towns and villages across the land, and indeed over the years across all her realms and territories. Of her beloved husband, Prince Philip, she once remarked that he was quite simply my strength and stay. So surely was the Queen to us the strength and stay of this nation, an exemplar of conduct and courtesy, gracious in her every act. Our gratitude to Her Majesty for her unfailing commitment and service to her country and the Commonwealth, and perhaps above all, our deep affection for her and for her memory will carry us through these dark days of mourning. We extend to her family and especially to our King our deepest sympathy in their personal loss. As we mark the end of Her Majesty's long and glorious reign, I would like to close with the words from the Gospel of Luke and from the service of evening prayer. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. Amen. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and my heart shall meditate and understand him. I will incline my ears to a parable. I will unfold my riddle with a liar. Of his soul. There is no price one could pay for it. So may my live forever and never see the grave. For we see that the wise die also, with the foolish and ignorant may perish, and live
those who have honor but lack understanding are like the beasts that perish. Such is the way of those who boast in themselves, the end of those who delight in their own words. Like a flock of sheep, they are destined to die. Death is their shepherd. They go down straight to the pit. count themselves happy while they live and praise you for your success they shall enter the company of their ancestors who will never more see the light those who have honor but lack understanding are like the beasts that perish And reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory.
Please pray for me that I may speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We always knew that these days of mourning and reflection would come one day, but many people have told me uh, what a shock it has been to them. We knew the Queen had health and mobility issues, but after the joy of her Platinum Jubilee, somehow she seemed even more immovable in our lives and our hearts. So we find ourselves today at a great but somehow unexpected turning point in our history, reflecting on a wonderful life of service, wondering what difference it will make to us personally and in our national life. I had a conversation this morning on the radio with my great friend Dr. Nigat Arif about how what we are doing now bears on our future. What opportunity do we have now while we can grasp it? Well, for the last nine days, we have been invited, if we want to, to step aside from the usual hurly-burly of the news cycle. You know, which politician is up or down, who is where on the greasy pole, celebrity, politics, um, as the King of Siam used to say, etc., etc. We can step back from all that and reflect in our hearts on some deep things we often forget that our Queen represented. A deep conviction that people matter more than things. Profound wisdom born of experience. Good humour, common sense, a listening ear. Love that honoured other people for who they were and brought the best out of them in all sorts of ways. Faith, love, and hope. Without these, the rest means nothing. I hope that days focusing on these realities will somehow help to resource us all and our leaders as we turn next week to various bulging national intrays. And tomorrow will show us strikingly, in a way we may have forgotten, how much our Queen really was a world figure. I wouldn't want to be whoever it is that has to organise busloads of world leaders before joining us in London tomorrow for her state funeral. But Elizabeth II represented the best that Britain can offer a restless world of change and political turmoil. Curiously, in some ways, the centre of our national life in this country is not a piece of paper or a political ideology. It's a human being, one who acquires experience and cumulative wisdom, intelligence, curiosity, faith and humanity, and who represents these things constantly. One of our greatest 20th century poets, Philip Larkin, was a famous old curmudgeon about pretty much everything, including the monarchy. But in 1977, he wrote a short poem called 1952 to 1977. In times when nothing stood but worsened or grew strange, there was one constant good. She did not change. Today, as in 1977. But of course, not the whole truth. She did change and walk with us as the monarchy evolved and developed through all the crises and turmoil of her long reign. But some things did not change. Underlying everything was a simple, unswerving faith and a great commitment to which she had vowed herself. Faith in God and in Jesus Christ as King of Kings and a commitment to serve the people of this country unstintingly in any way that she could. I was very struck by the way she signed off her Platinum Jubilee message. Your servant, Elizabeth. Expressing a truth that underlay all that she did 
in her own unstinting, unpretentious way. This said that true authority does not come from assertion or fame or celebrity, not from money or even armies, but from service. Those who want to be great should first be the servant of all. It's said that in one of the Jubilee tours, our Queen was talking to someone on a reception line when suddenly their mobile phone went off. And this back in the days of da 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 And as he squirmed in embarrassment, waiting for the ground to swallow him up, she said, I think you'd better answer that. It might be someone important. <laughs> The ground of her strong service ethic and hard work, her personal anchor, which she didn't wear on her sleeve or push at people, perhaps it was too deep for words, was her faith, radically unsectarian. And she saw the role of the church, of which she was supreme governor, in a very interesting way. Its job was gently and unassuredly, and unassuredly to create an environment for all faith communities, indeed people of no religious faith, to live freely together and flourish. So what do we take for ourselves from this wonderful life? The prophet Isaiah brings us words of hope, a great vision for what could be. Healing, freedom, justice, peace. Release from all that imprisons our spirits and holds back our potential. And as we mourn, oil of comfort, gladness, praise in the place of a faint spirit, that we too may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. It's a better and bigger vision of all that we could be. And what about us? Well, the Queen's first public broadcast on the 13th of October 1940 came at the most precarious time of danger in her lifetime, and it shows the way, even to those of us who have years but are still children of today with our short-term cycles and centres of attention. When peace comes, said Elizabeth, remember that it will be for us, the children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better and a happier place. But how? Some favourite words of St Paul that the Queen treasured. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things be of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, Think on these things, those things which ye both learnt and received and heard and seen in me, these things do, and the God of peace shall go with you.
Almighty God, we give you thanks for Charles, your servant and our king, for his devotion to his family, this nation, the Commonwealth, and to the earth, our fragile home. We thank you for his faith in you and his love for all peoples and for his call to be our sovereign in such a time as this. Bless and protect Charles in all the years to come. Grant him long to reign over us and give him gifts of wisdom and discernment as together we face the opportunities and challenges of our age. Bless Camilla, the Queen Consort, William, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family in this time of mourning and of change. May we all abide in your love, draw strength from the deep wells of Christian hope, and dedicate ourselves afresh to God's kingdom of justice and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Psalm twenty three. The Lord is my shepherd. Therefore can I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He shall refresh my soul and guide me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup shall be full. Surely goodness and loving mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. On behalf of the faith communities of the city of Milton Kings, their representatives will come forward to light a candle. In behalf of the Baha'i community, Latif Rollins. in behalf of the Buddhist community, Sister Maruta. In behalf of the Christian community, Andrew Gary and Marie Bradburn.
in behalf of the Hindu community, Manish Verma. in behalf of the Jewish community, as V. Friedman. In behalf of the Muslim community, Nasim Khan and Salina Raja.
eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we bless thy holy name for all that thou hast given us in and through the life of thy daughter Elizabeth. We give thee thanks for her love of family and her gift of friendship, for her grace, dignity and courtesy, for her humour, generosity and sheer love of life. And we praise thee for the courage she showed in times of hardship, for the depth and reality of her Christian faith, for the good example she set for us to follow. We offer thee our heartfelt thanks for the deep affection she drew out of everyone she met, and we pray that thou wilt grant her peace, let light perpetual shine upon her, and in thy loving wisdom and almighty power work in her the good purpose of thy perfect will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Bring us, O Lord our God, at our last awakening into the house and gate of heaven, to enter into that gate and dwell in that house, where there shall be no darkness nor dazzling, but one equal light, no noise nor silence, but one equal music, no fears nor hopes, but one equal possession, no end nor beginning, but one equal eternity, when the habitation of thy glory and dominion, world without end. Amen. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I see myself now at the end of my journey. My toilsome days are ended. I am going now to see that head that was crowned with thorns and that face that was spit upon for me. I have formerly lived by hearsay and faith, but now I go where I shall live by sight and shall be with him in whose company I delight myself. I have loved to hear my Lord spoken of, and whatever I see, wherever I see the print of his shoe in the earth, there I have coveted to set my foot to. His name to me has been as a civet box, yea, sweeter than all perfume. His voice to me has been most sweet, and his countenance I have more desired than they that have most desired the light of the sun. His word I did use to gather for my food and for antidotes against my faintings. He has held me and hath kept me from mine iniquities. Yea, my steps hath he strengthened in his way. Glorious it was to see how the open region was filled with horses and chariots, with trumpeters and pipers, with singers and players on stringed instruments to welcome the pilgrims as they went up and followed one another in at the beautiful gate of the city. <clears throat>
Let us commend our sister Elizabeth to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. O Heavenly Father, who by thy mighty power hast given us life, and in thy love hast given us new life in thy beloved Son, we entrust our sister Elizabeth to thy merciful keeping in the faith of the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died and rose again to save us, and now liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. There will be a retiring collection after the service. The baskets will be available in reception. The collection will be for the mayor's favorite charity and for the hardship fund of this church. Afterwards, you are invited to join us for refreshments in the guild hall through the bureau. of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you 
and remain with you always.